Greetings, I'm Ron Clement, and this is In the Studio. I've been an avid reader of science fiction since I was a kid. One of the things I love about Davis is that I've always been able to go to a locally owned, independent bookstore where I can browse and buy from an excellent inventory of science fiction books. In this town, I can always find someone who shares my passion for the genre. And if I happen to be riding my bicycle through village homes, I may well chance upon one of science fiction's most honored writers. That man, Kim Stanley Robinson, is our guest today. Stan is the author of numerous novels, novellas, and short stories. Among his works are New York Times bestsellers, and he, is the, uh, and he has won the Locus, World Fantasy, Hugo, Campbell, and Nebula Awards. Stan? It's a pleasure having you here. Welcome Thanks, to Ron. the show. My pleasure. It's so, good to be on. I understand you've lived in Davis for a long time. What, uh, what first brought you to the community? Well, I came here uh, with a girlfriend in 1978, and then um, I stayed until um, 1980 or so and went back to San Diego, came back to uh, get together with uh, my wife, Lisa, and we've... Um, We've been married now 30 years, and we were in Davis while she finished her degree. We left in 1985 for two years in Zurich and four years in Washington, and then came back to Davis to uh, bring up our kids and, and spend the time here since, I guess it's now been 22 years that we've been back. We came back in 91. Oh. So three stints in Davis for me. Hey, you see yourself staying here indefinitely? It's home. I've, I've lived here so long that uh, although I grew up in Southern California, I think of it as home and uh, I like it. So it's, it's our home. Well, I love Davis. I've been here since 1967. And uh, mm -hmm. of all the places I've been, uh, this is one I always want to come back to. Very nice place to live. Great place to raise a family as well. That's right. And also, it's a, um, it's a small town. You know people. It has a small town feel. It has a Small town efficiencies, you can get a lot of work done, you don't get caught in traffic jams. Um, there's a lot of things about Davis that I forget through the years because I've been here so long. I forget how uh, much I like them because I take them for granted. But then when I go other places and I come back, I realize that um, these are real advantages for living a sane and productive life. That's always good to hear. And yeah. Uh, were you committed to being a full-time writer when you came to Davis, or did that develop after you got here? That is uh, really uh, just a manifestation of the last uh, 20 years. I was a, a teacher at UC Davis. I taught freshman composition, so I was a visiting lecturer. And then uh, when our kids were born, I was the home parent. I took care of the boys. While my wife has been a full-time scientist the whole time. Mm -hmm. So um, it was only really with the success of Red Mars and the fact that we had two kids to take care of that I stopped doing teaching and started writing uh, really part-time, but they call it full-time because I didn't do anything else except bring up the boys. Do, do, what, were you trying to be a writer or were you sort of, when you say part-time, developing full-time, is that fairly typical? For an author? <clears throat> I think it has to be. Really, uh, writing is a, a strange game, and there's a lot of um, what you might call um, unrewarded excellence out in the world of the arts, so that um, you have to think of it as a part-time job, I think, the whole time until the circumstances change. And that is a little bit out of your control. It, it has to do with audiences and publishers and... Mm -hmm. um, Essentially, no matter what you write, you can't really control its fate in the world. So it's best to scaffold that uh, artistic existence with a, a real paying job, which is what I say to all beginning writers, all students, everybody interested. Uh, do it for the love of it, do it part time, mm -hmm. have something that pays the bills and that also teaches you things about the world that you can then put into your writing. So a job is not just paying the bills, but also giving you raw material for your writing. So um, it has a dual purpose, that, and both of them are crucial. Uh, with your family, did you decide to give it a try for a while or to just really dig in? Uh, well, I mean, after, after Red Mars is an example. So. Well, after Red Mars, then at that point, someone had to be the parent at home, at least uh, if that was possible, and, uh, and it was, because I could essentially write during nap time. Mm -hmm. I could write uh, when my wife was home. Uh, the great thing about writing is that you can do it in the time that you have for it and not have to have structured hours. So um, 
what would you say that's your discipline or could you generalize uh, I for think professional uh, writers? Uh, well, it's a good question. I can't generalize because I think every professional writer has a different pattern and a different uh, history that mm -hmm. they came to it. But I think most of them would talk about this surprising moment when they were actually selling enough copies and getting big enough advances that they could call that their main job. Typically, they would be doing something else and then realize that they're, um, they would make more money for any given hour of work writing than doing anything else. Well, that's unusual and surprising, and, and it is... Uh, the writer's epiphany. Yeah, and it's kind of wonderful, because at that point you can really throw yourself into it and, and uh, not be distracted and not lose time doing other things. So if you're interested to write novels, novels are very time-intensive, very labor-intensive. I reckon I work maybe, I don't know, five hours a page on these books, and so when you think about how many pages there are, the hours stack up. So if you have to do other things to pay the bills, then it's going to take you that much longer to write a novel. Once you get to go full time, then you can just do them faster. Did you choose science fiction or did it choose you? In a way, I think it chose me. What I think about science fiction is that it is the realism of California and really of the world now. And this has been developing over my career. And when I said it 30 years ago or even 40 years mm -hmm. ago, it sounded a little bit strange. But when I say it now, I think people will understand. Our world is completely formed by science, that we live within a scientific culture and our actually built infrastructure, our lives, our medical lives, our social lives in the internet and everything. They're all scientifically created. So now when you write science fiction, you're describing the society that we live in right now, so you're doing realism. So I was always interested in writing about the, the real lives that we live, the real world that we're in, but I chose science fiction because it struck me that was the most accurate way to do it. That was the way that had the most uh, charge to it artistically. Mm -hmm. Do you have a working definition for, that you use for science fiction? Yes, it's very simple. I'd say science fiction is any story that is set in the future. And then there are some little corollaries that have to be tucked in there. Like if you postulate that something different happened in the past, like say the Axis won World War II or the South won the Civil War or something like that, those are alternative histories mm -hmm. and they get counted as science fiction because they're a different future for a past moment. So that's a, alternative histories are a little complicated, but by and large what you can say is that if a story is set tomorrow in the story, that's a science fiction story. If it's set 100 years in the future, it's still science fiction. And it's a very, that's a very simple, like, um, sort of Damocles type definition. Mm -hmm. If it's in the future, it's science fiction. So I, I, I would agree. I, I think of Harry Turtledove as an example, as, yes. um, of, I mean, more like Jules Verne, in a sense of feeling historical at this point, an alternate history. Well, Turtle Dove is the great alternative history writer. He's specialized in it. He's made it his career. Well, he'll take various moments in the past and he'll postulate a change where something different happened, uh, like Napoleon conquered Europe. And uh, I'm giving only military examples, but uh, my alternative history was if everybody in Europe had died in the Black Death, what would have happened to world history after that? And that's the years of rice and salt a novel that actually ends up in Davis, California. But of course, because of my uh, change, uh, Davis, California is the farm university for a Chinese-Japanese culture <laughs> because North America has been uh, colonized from west to east. And the diseases that would have been brought to North America, no matter who brought them, have uh, devastated the Native Americans as they did in our timeline. So alternative histories play that game. Mm -hmm. But uh, science fiction plays the same game starting with this moment and going off into the future. What if we postulate this happened, we'll get to that kind of future. Maybe it's dystopian, maybe it's utopian. And you postulate other changes and you get to different kind of futures. And it makes you think about what we're doing right now in terms of what will come next. So I think it's a powerful way to talk about um, our society right now, and it's also a lot of fun. You get the great adventures, you get the great senses of possibility, mm -hmm. you get off planet. Um, it's, it's, um, it's been my, my um, intellectual home, like Davis has been my physical home. I would say that I live in the small town of science fiction as my intellectual home. And even though the weather's nice here, I can still uh, feel the cold of Antarctica from your writing. <laughs> yes. Wow, that was quite an experience. Stan, if I could, maybe we could explore your creative process. Uh, we've got several of your books here. 
Maybe if you if you wanted to choose one and we could yeah, kind of go through what happened. I'll take the latest one because I can remember what happened in it or how it came about. Uh, 2312, I uh, just published last year, and so this paperback edition is brand new. Um, well, I had... So where'd, yeah, where'd you get the idea? The idea for the story was very simple. Um, I wanted to make a kind of a joke. I wanted a love story. It started with the idea for a romance between a mercurial person and a Saturnine person. And these are astrological signs and personalities, and uh, really they're kind of antiquated and nobody really t truly believes them anymore, but I thought... You still find those people out there. There right? are mercurial people. <laughs> there are Saturnine people, exactly. And uh, uh, mercurial, I thought my mercurial people person would be from Mercury, and my Saturnine person would be from Saturn, and then it was a kind of a joke. And, but it all followed from that, because if you have human beings living on Mercury, well, you need it to be about the year 2312. You have to be 300 years out before it becomes plausible. Okay. Same with Saturn. So I, I decided to go out 300 years, which for my science fiction is going way out there. I think it's the furthest uh, in the future of any science fiction novel I've ever written, at least of my major work. Yeah, you're kind of a near future. I'm a near future guy, yeah. and and uh, and yet, having had this idea in, early in my career, I had novels like Ice Engine and The Memory of Whiteness that mm -hmm. were solar system novels, a couple few hundred years in the future. So I stole from myself. I went back to my uh, work of my 20s, and I took things like a rolling city on Mercury, because Mercury rotates so slowly that you could have a city on train tracks and it would only have to go about five miles an hour to stay in the shade, because it cannot be in the sun or it would be cooked. What kind of temperature difference? Uh, well, I yes. think it's 700 degrees Fahrenheit on the sunny side mm -hmm. and um, um, very uh, cold in on the night side, like, say, um, I'm not sure about this, maybe 250 or 300 degrees below zero. Wow. So it's a massive uh, change, but in the, in the zone between light and shade, you've got about a 30 or 40 mile wide zone that is essentially the dawn uh, mm -hmm. terminator. And I have my city being pushed by sunlight, by the power of sunlight, always into the darkness. And so just one tiny fraction of the city, the highest point is in sun, and that solar powers the whole rest of the city to move on these tracks. Well, this is a crazy That's idea from my, from, my, from my 20s, and, mm -hmm. and, and I just recycled it because the, it's very definitely true that the only person you can justifiably steal from is yourself. So I, I took from my previous work, and I concocted this, and I had a wonderful editor at Orbit Books. It was the first time we had worked together, and he kept encouraging me. He said, make it big. Just show us everything else in the solar system. What's going on on Earth? What's going on on Mars? And uh, how far out are they? And, and so he forced me to um, develop the idea and make it bigger than I might have otherwise. And so this That's is true. the process. Uh, reviewers often put you in the hard science category from yes. what I've read, because I mean, you delve into chemistry and physics and biology in and, and some very significant ways. But I, I was looking back at uh, your background in uh, bachelor's in literature, master's in PhD in English. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yet you seem to write very deftly um, uh, about science. So how, does, how do you get from literature to, to being an adept scientist? I mean, I mean we look at David Brin. We right. say, oh, well, okay, right. he's a scientist. Right. Well, thank you for that. I, it's, a, it's mostly an English major's trick. It's a matter of rhetoric and looking plausible. It's a kind of a stage magic. Mm. If you can imitate the way scientists talk, then you can make things look very plausible. And science, I find, is extremely public. They're trying to be accessible. They're trying to be comprehensible. It's just that the world itself is complicated, and that's why science looks complicated, because the world is complicated. But science is not like legal language, where they're trying to be esoteric and, and using a jargon deliberately to obfuscate the situation. Science is trying to explain things as clearly as it can. And once you understand that and take it on that level, then you just read science news, you read um, the internet uh, articles about the situations, and then you talk to scientists themselves about their work, and it turns out to be a matter of, of imitating their style and paying attention to what they say to you, and then you can do anything. I would say, though, that I'm not a hard science fiction writer, and I don't like any of these sub-labels. There's hard science fiction, there's soft science fiction, whatever that would be, sociology or uh, anthropology. There's feminist science fiction, there's literary science fiction, there's military science fiction, there's uh, techno-thrillers. Well, all of these are way too um, 
confining and restraining. Uh, science fiction itself is already a genre very limited and specific. Well, you have lowbrow, so, high, highbrow in a sense. I mean, Yes, but this is what science fiction helps to break down. There's no lowbrow and highbrow. You've got the silliest movies ever made are science fiction movies. Some of the greatest novels of the 20th century are science fiction novels. And so it's a very tall uh, genre vertically between highbrow and lowbrow. And what it what it's trying to say is there's no such thing as highbrow and lowbrow. There's just um, art that entertains. And if it works, it works okay. at one level or another. So I've never, I, I don't like any of these distinctions. I have accepted the label science fiction writer because I think science fiction is interesting and important. But all the finer distinctions, I think, are, are cutting it too fine and trying to make pigeonholes so small that people don't want to go in there. Well, we live in a world where uh, we want to put everything in silos, don't we? Yes, and, that's right. Uh, parse everything. Um, now, as you're working on your book, um, are, are there people you rely on, um, uh, insiders, to, to, for feedback, to review your drafts? I've noticed, as, as I read, that it seems in recent years, maybe with the advent of the Internet, that the acknowledgment sections of books seem to be growing. I've always put an acknowledgement section in the back of my books uh, because I get a lot of help, but I don't um, want people reading my drafts. Okay. So I ask them questions and I do a lot of, um, of research ahead of time that involves interviewing people. And so that there's a planetary scientist down at NASA Ames, uh, Chris McKay. Well, ever since Red Mars, he's been there to answer oddball questions about the solar system Ooh. for me. So you'll did see. Did you find him, or did he I, found you? I, I think I read about him in the literature on Mars, and then I just called him up. And most scientists, if you call them up, they'll be happy to talk. In fact, the real problem is getting them to stop talking about their area of specialty. Um, but I've learned to be good at that, too. Uh, well, you live in Davis, which uh, is full of academics. Uh, yes, so. and the university. And we all love to talk. And Village Homes <laughs> is uh, filled with uh, scientists and ecologists, uh, agricultural specialists, zoologists. So um, there's no problem with getting expert help. And mm -hmm. most experts are happy to help. So I, And I'm happy to acknowledge that a novel is not one person making up things out of their head that is somehow an individual act of uh, creativity. I think novels are more like being the, um, the telephone central exchange operator that is plugging in a lot of voices into one story and you, and you plug in enough voices and you get a kind of a group uh, message that's bigger than you. And it's not just your imagination, it's you speaking a community's worth of information. Well, with, with 2312, um, from initial idea, yeah. Uh, Saturnine and Mercurial, uh, to turning the final draft into your publisher. Um, how long? I would think that would be about four years. Four years. Um, but the initial idea often precedes by a good long time the actual starting of the writing. And the writing, I can say, took more like one year of uh, intense work. Um, and, but uh, Do you start with, with, with treatments or outlines or sample, or do you try to get the whole thing done? Basically. Oh, just of the barest of uh, suggestions as to the idea. Almost love story, mercurial, Saturnine person, need the solar system, that's all I know. Okay. And then uh, what I need is for uh, an editor to say, yes, I like that idea, go with it. That can take some time. And the research can take a little time, although usually I'm researching while I'm writing, so the two go together. Um, well, and, uh, you mentioned uh, your, your agent or your publisher, your yep. editor. Well, yep. How did you find these people, or did they find you? Um, I, I, my agent um, uh, died a couple years ago, and so this has been a great disaster mm -hmm. in my uh, professional life, a beautiful guy. Um, but uh, essentially, I was connected to him as in the late 1980s. And after that, I had a kind of a uh, manager or my, an agent that was more like an older brother that basically knew so much more about the industry that I just stayed in Davis and wrote my books. And he did the uh, strategic thinking very well. And um, I, I felt like I was uh, uh, taken care of in a way that allowed me to just focus on the art. And then the commerce side of it was his job, which he did beautifully. So one of the reasons I've had such a great career was uh, Ralph Fitch and Anza. And uh, now I'm working with one of Ralph's assistants, and I presume it'll, um, it'll be okay, but I'm at the tail end of my career anyway, and um, in a way, the ghost of Ralph. Is, isn't will. that presumptuous? You're at the tail end of your career? Well, I'm just assuming chronologically. <laughs> um, I hope for a late Picasso-like burst of uh, ancient energy, but novels are, uh, 
you know, they're time intensive. And well, you, you could bring on a second. I mean, we see quite a bit of that now. And I mean, some of the grand, so-called grandmasters certainly did that. No, Heidlin and I would, Nevin and... no, terrible idea. I would never <laughs> do that. No. One of the great joys of writing novels is you don't have to collaborate. You do your own thing. And I can't believe these guys do that. So we, we won't see one with you and <laughs> no, Spider Robinson. No, huh? no, 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 no. <laughs> terrible idea. Callahan's cross time planet or something. No? <laughs> no, Spider's a great writer and everything. But no, I, I love um, the idea that I write the books on my own. And in fact, I don't have much in the way of advice. I, I don't really like my books being edited. I, I just want to write them in the way I want to write them. I put them out there. They are strange books. They don't resemble other novels. Uh, people tell me that in no uncertain terms. So I, and I like that. So I, I just do my own thing. Well, I enjoy reading your books. Well, thank you, thank you. Some, well, some more than others, yeah, but uh, they're, they're yeah. always stimulating. They're experiments, so. and they have a high positive and they have a high negative. And I take it that that's because they're they're different and a little weird. Well, sp speaking of negative, I mean it's a different context, but it seems over the last I don't know maybe fifteen years, science fiction has become somewhat darker, fatalistic, pessimistic, if you will, and. Um, one of your peers, uh, the writer uh, Neil Stevenson, um, a couple of years ago uh, was asked about the state of science fiction, and he said something to the effect of, you notice it's dystopian. Yeah. And um, what's your take on that? I mean, the dark versus the light, dystopian versus hopeful. Um, well, I think it's happened. I think uh, that perception is correct, that science fiction has gotten kind of dystopian between um, people like Paolo Bacigalupi and also The Hunger Games, a very important mm -hmm. science fiction. And what I think is that people's sense of the future has gotten darker, and science fiction is very responsive to the way the current society thinks about the future. So uh, science fiction was very positive in the 40s because a bunch of engineers and a bunch of kids in the rural America reading it we're saying, hey, the future is going to be great. We'll have nuclear power. We'll be living on Mars. It's just fantastic. It'd be better than this farm that I'm stuck on, working, you know, uh, doing physical labor and suffering when I'm an intellectual that wants to live, you know, around the rings of Saturn. So you have this positive science fiction back then in the 30s and 40s, the so-called golden age, and it makes perfect <laughs> sense. Well, now we had 9/11, uh, big trauma where we suddenly realized that history isn't over and this planet is not arranged. Um, coherently in terms of everybody's society, and you have climate change, which is surely happening and is sure to come. Mm -hmm. And so young people reading are thinking, well, the future, is it, are we even going to be able to live as well as our parents and grandparents? It isn't an obvious yes. So science fiction is very sensitive. It's like a canary in a coal mine, and it responds to these emotions. It's a very emotional literature, despite the techy, uh, Spock-like uh, aspect. But remember, Spock has got this violently <laughs> emotional uh, human side to it. And, and so it, does science fiction. It lives fiction. in another alternate universe as well. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, science fiction has been saying lately, the future could be dark. And mm -hmm. it's a kind of a 1984 warning sign. It, uh, it's trying to say to the world, let's not go down this path, because it would be horrible. It would be like The Hunger Games, or like... Um, Bacha Galupi's um, uh, wind up girl. Yeah, yeah Shipbreaker. And, uh, well, maybe we're just being more realistic, too. Uh, science fiction is based on science, scientific knowledge grows. We now know that it's highly uh, unlikely that we'll go into space, kill the bugs, and take our place in the galaxy, although those space operas were wonderful <laughs> stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe the last big one was Orson Scott Card. Right. But that turned into a real philosophical treatise. Well, I, I, I think that's right. And uh, space opera will always exist as a kind of fantasy space mm -hmm. where you can tell great stories it. and it's fun to read. And what you can say is maybe in uh, 5,000 or 500,000 years, humans will be doing this stuff around the galaxy. It's not perhaps impossible. And so let's tell those stories. And that's a lot of fun. Because science fiction, in the end, is always about having fun. Even the darkest stuff, these dystopias, you're thinking, ah, oh, but it would be so interesting to survive, to make do, to make a fire in the dark and manage to feed your family. And it's always exciting, let's put it that way. And I don't think it's being more realistic now to say that our future is going to be dark because we don't know what our future is going to be like. And science, because it keeps on advancing and because uh, one of the sciences is justice, Another science is um, social systems. In mm -hmm. other words, the software of society is also getting better. We're globalized. Everybody in the world has got their cell phone. Everybody in the world knows what's going on. There's no more ignorance. 
and the potential for good out of that situation is as big as the potential for bad out of climate change and the various problems we have. So there's a, a, real, uh, a realistic possibility of utopia as well as a realistic possibility of dystopia. And that's the strangeness of our time, that both these very different futures are both quite possible. So then we get to choose, we get to work towards the good one, and this science fiction outlines them both. Most of my science fiction has been utopian and positive, trying mm -hmm. to describe worlds where things are going well, or else, like in the, these science in the capital books, uh, 40, 50, 60, dealing with problems in a rational manner to try to make things better. Um, I it's found the, the idea of the Gulf Stream stopping still scares people to death. And yes, um, although less likely now that they've done the numbers on the amount of fresh water necessary in the North Atlantic, which is really what causes the Gulf Stream to stall, is not likely to happen in the way that I described it. But I was working on information from the year 2000 rather than the year 2013. Mm -hmm. So, Well, we still have Governor Christie of New Jersey standing out there on the <laughs> sand saying we're going to rebuild and, and save these disappearing barrier islands. So. Well, this is okay. I mean, we are going to have to be adapting and uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's good to make statements that whatever, uh, say it's 50 years from now or 100 years from now, those people are not going to be sitting down going, oh, they blew it 50 years ago, and so now we're going to sit on the beach and weep. They're actually going to be working, dealing, making do, and making the best of things, no matter what situation they're in. Well, and Stan, now that 2312 is doing so, so well, uh, have you taken a break? Or are you working on something new? <laughs> no, I don't take breaks. I like writing, and it's my job. And so I've, I've got a book coming out next month um, called Shaman, which is about um, the people of 32,000 years ago that painted the Chauvet Cave in southern France. Oh. So that recent movie by Werner Herzog called The Cave of Forgotten Dreams is about this cave that was just discovered in 1995. Um, and it's one of the most beautiful of the painted caves of southern France, equal to Lascaux and Altamira, and yet it's twice as old as those caves. We seem to be pushing back the time that humankind arrived in Europe. Yes, that's right. Uh, the archaeologists keep pushing back that time. And, and, and the Americas as well, so as we learn more. That gets all very complicated, that, <laughs> this whole problem of when the Americas were peopled. But yes, it keeps getting pushed back. So when are we going to see Shaman? When that is think? September 3rd. And books have birthdays these days. Oh, so days. you've wrapped it. Oh, yes. It's, uh, it, everything is ready to go. Um, uh, books have birthdays because of the uh, e-book e downloads. You have to pick a moment during which people can then hit the button and download it. So that will be September 3rd. Okay. Well, Stan, uh, we're, we're just about at the end of the show. And uh, I would like to do one thing. Uh, your son, Tim, is, I, an in, is an intern here at uh, Davis Media Access. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank him for yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, talking into coming on the show. And Tim's behind camera one. I, I don't know if we can get a shot of Tim on there. And maybe you'd like to w wave. Uh, yeah, he uh, can do his cameraman thing. It's like in the, the baseball stadiums. The cameramen always just um, keep doing their work, as you know. Great. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. Th I have many things to thank Tim for. Uh, and this is one of them. So, Stan, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, I wish you the best of luck with uh, Shaman and every other book that comes out. And I'll look forward to reading them. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Stan's books, of course, are, are generally available. Uh, if you're looking for a good read, uh, please check them out if you haven't already. And uh, uh, until next time, this is Ron Clement. Thank you for watching in the studio. And thank you, Davis. <laughs>